we unanimously decided within our bath labs on these calls that no pipeline will ever cross our territory. Tonight, the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline sows the seeds of discontent on the Maurice River in northern British Columbia. I came across these old photos of these giant uh, buffalo mounds uh, of skulls and bones in these massive piles. And as I sort of uh, dug into the research behind that, um, there was a connection to John A's uh, McDonald's executive order to do that in the prairies as a means of a military tactic. A multimedia artist examines Canada's history of genocide. I come to her in spirit form and dance with her and we connect with her. And a new film by Kwanlin Dunn filmmaker debuts at the Vancouver International Film Festival. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Residents of Iqaluit are being told by their mayor to stop drinking the tap water. Mayor Kenneth Bell took to Twitter today saying, quote, a PSA from the government of Nunavut and the city of Iqaluit is coming out soon with information, but in the time being, please do not drink the water. More tests happening and clear information coming, end quote. The move comes a week after people had been complaining on social media that their water smells like gasoline, chlorine and diesel. The city posted to Facebook on October 4th that all test results were satisfactory. And now they've called an emergency council meeting that is going on right now. We will bring you more updates as they become available. A new report has found housing inequality continues to be a serious issue for vulnerable people living in the Yukon. The report was released by the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition. It found while there has been some improvements to Whitehorse's housing crisis over the last decade, the supply of housing units has not kept up with demand. It also noted 19% of respondents are using more than half of their income on housing expenses. The co-chair of the coalition says housing inequality needs to be urgently addressed. Our population has grown, the housing crisis has deepened, and we have COVID on top of it, which makes it really necessary for people to be able to have a safe place to call home and to shelter. We want to hear what you think about housing inequality in your own community. Here's how to continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on our website, aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. In northern BC, the Wet'suwet'en pipeline dispute continues, with blockades up for the last two weeks. Coastal GasLink has an injunction against blockades, and RCMP are on the ground and talking with hereditary chiefs, but the protest continues. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. This is the drill pad site where they plan to drill under Wadinkwa. Slado, Molly Wickham, Spokesperson for the Get em Done Access Point stands in front of a log cabin built to the drill site for a natural gas pipeline. For two weeks, Wet'suwet'en and its supporters put up blockades to stop pipeline builder Coastal GasLink from working to pass the pipeline under the Wadzinkwa or Maurice River. Jennifer Wickham is media coordinator for the Get em Done Access Point. She says their five clans are opposed to the pipeline. All five of our Clans have unanimously decided within our bath labs, our feast hall, that no pipeline will ever cross our territory. And we want to protect our clean drinking water and our salmon for all the future generations. Coastal Gas Link has an injunction against blockades in the contested area. Last week, the company said they planned a microtunnel under the river, stating that it was deemed the safest way. According to police, there were two arrests last week as the blockade started. In an email statement to APTN, an RCMP spokesperson said there were no arrests this week and officers are in talks with the hereditary chiefs. There is a police presence in the area 
and our division liaison team continues to be engaged. Efforts are still ongoing to have discussions with all stakeholders regarding this matter. Gidamdan Access Point. Confirmed police have talked to hereditary chief of the Gidamdan clan, Was. I can give you the number of but our there have been no board. talks between the company and the hereditary chiefs. An email statement to APTN News. Coastal Gaslink said there are no updates to add to last week's statement, but they are open to find a resolution. Coastal Gaslink will continue to keep lines of communication open in an effort to resolve the differences and provide information to address concerns. Wickham says governments and companies need to have free, prior, and informed consent of Indigenous people or protests will keep happening. It's not just Indigenous people that are standing up and saying that this is not okay. It's non-Indigenous allies and our, our Canadian citizens are saying that the government needs to be held accountable and be responsible for their actions against Indigenous people. Wickham says they hope Wet'suwet'en solidarity protests soon start around the country. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. A Winnipeg school division is discontinuing a program that put police officers in their schools. As our Daryl Stranger shows us, they're instead moving towards implementing a new diversity, inclusion and anti-racism initiative. This week, the Louis Real School Division put an end to the school resource officer program, which had one Winnipeg police officer working across the division's 40 schools since 2016. Feedback from staff, students and families, including BIPOC students feeling uneasy with the presence of an officer around, led the school division to use the resources for the SRO program on a new diversity and anti-racism initiative. Whether they identify as Indigenous, or, uh, or as a person of color, uh, and no matter their social economic circumstance, that we not see the gaps that we see at present when it comes to learning outcomes, uh, that we not see the differences that we see when we look at uh, well-becoming, when we look at uh, what kids are telling us about how they're feeling, how they're doing, uh, how they feel anxious, how they feel in terms of their sense of belonging. LRSD priorities include implementing a curriculum review emphasizing anti-racism and decolonization and adding an anti-racism education office. That overarching policy will guide actions in many areas, um, starting with uh, professional learning. We, uh, we really need to um, develop a, a curriculum for staff that uh, focuses on the issues and uh, and um, and focuses on on t focuses on anti-racism, decolonization. They are also working with organizations like the Community Education Development Association, which serves Winnipeg students and families, teachers, and school administration. Just from a curriculum standpoint, things that continue to. Uh, bring in vo uh, other voices, other authors, other historical narratives that accurately represent uh, Indigenous history. And then from a, a BIPOC standpoint of Black, Indigenous and peoples of colour, uh, again at the levels of decision making at the board and otherwise, um, how uh, the community can have its voice better represented by folks that are, are present at those tables. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. To the COVID-19 pandemic now and Quebec is taking a drastic step within its health care system. The government has decided to not only lay off unvaccinated nurses, it's also going to suspend their licenses. The move takes effect this Friday and according to Quebec's order of nurses, more than 4,300 of its members have not been fully vaccinated and the status of another 5,700 is yet to be ver verified. Hello. Well, surging COVID-19 numbers have prompted a new Brunswick hospital to move to red alert level. As the province reports more than 1,000 active cases, hospitals are postponing some non-urgent procedures. Under a red alert, hospitals are able to reduce or temporarily suspend elective surgeries and non-urgent scans and x-rays. Visits are also temporarily suspended across all hospitals in the province. The province's health minister, Dorothy Shepard, says that means an immediate reduction in services. 
At Vitalite facilities, all non-essential services will be reduced or temporarily suspended, including ambulatory care services, professional services such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and nutrition, non-urgent medical imaging services, and elective surgeries. Patients who are affected by these measures will be contacted directly. And a very telling statistic was also shared by the province today. Since August 1st of the ICU admissions for COVID-19, 1.8 cases per 100,000 people were vaccinated. That number jumps to 33.4 people per 100,000 among the unvaccinated. Well, still to come, questions about the site of a former residential school. Stick around. Welcome back. It's been five decades now that the Notre Dame Residential School in Manayutanam, Quebec has been closed. The site where it was located is now used for a popular annual music festival. But with the remains of missing children being found all over former sites around the country, some are wondering if any secrets might be lurking under the ground. The story is by Silly Ambrose, narrated by Lindsay Richardson. The annual Inu Nigamu Music Festival is beloved by the people of Manutenam. For nearly 40 years, the annual festival held here has been a source of joy. But for all the good times, it's never far from people's minds that this location is the site of a former residential school. <laughs> Daniel Fontaine of Maniutnam is a residential school survivor. He says he's mostly healed from his time at the local Notre Dame school, but still finds talking about it difficult. He says he witnessed repeated injustices. Despite the difficult times he had at the school, he says prayer helps him from dwelling on the past. But Fontaine was shaken by recent announcements of remains of children being found on former residential school sites across the country. The Notre Dame Residential School closed its doors in 1970. There has been talk about searching the grounds there. To permit to this site to de, flourish, de it's a symbol extremely fort de résilience et de, de résistance pacifique. Kevin Bacon Hervieux is the coordinator for the Inu Nigamu Festival. He says the festival was created by former students of Notre Dame. This year it was held online due to the pandemic. He adds that whatever happens, the festival will continue to serve as a way for the community to heal. There are a lot of people who have qui ont décidé de créer ce festival-là et de l'organiser à chaque année. Et ça l'a fait en sorte que la, le, ce que ça représente pour les gens de ma génération, ce site-là, c'est pas le pensionnat, c'est le festival, c'est courir partout avec nos amis, c'est de voir des spectacles. According to community leaders, the plan to search the site will be revealed later this fall. A story by Sylvie Amboise, ABTN National News, Manutenam, Quebec. Multimedia artist Jay Soul's work is about the angst of Indigenous people, something his creative new art exhibit certainly portrays, as it spills both shock and truth onto the streets of Toronto. As Annette Francis tells us, it's a big pile of history. 
It's not every day that you would see a massive stack of buffalo skulls sitting in downtown Toronto like this. It's a creation by Chippewa artist Jay Soul. It's called Built on Genocide. The idea behind it was to create awareness around uh, you know, the first kind of known genocide uh, that uh, was uh, perpetrated by the Canadian government to Indigenous people, and uh, first and foremost starting with the, um, the slaughtering of the bison in, in the prairies as a means of uh, a military tactic um, to dispossess Indigenous people of their lands and, and uh, the ability to clothe themselves, house themselves and feed themselves. Seoul's outdoor exhibit is presented by the Luminato Festival at Toronto's Harbourfront Centre. The idea came from a research project he was working on five years ago. Um, I came across these old photos of these giant uh, buffalo mounds uh, of skulls and bones in these massive piles. And as I sort of uh, dug into the research behind that, um, there was a connection to John A's uh, McDonald's executive order to do that in the prairies as a means of a military tactic. Um, within the Canadian history books, it's sort of, it, it's lied about. It's saying it was for the expansion of the railroad and for um, uh, land for settler uh, to set up, uh, you know, settler homes and farms. Matt Pereira is visiting from Vancouver. He came downtown specifically to see this. He says it's powerful. I think it paints a really good statement that we are built on the lives of Indigenous people. There's a lot of reconciliation that still needs to happen, and especially in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Day happening on the 30th. I think this is a really important message. Surrounding the installation are 20 images that Seoul created to highlight the continued devastation on Indigenous peoples. Tanya Bruce says it's a brutal honesty that needs to be talked about. I think this is really important for Canadians to, to see it this way. I think we I think we require and we demand that the story is always told in a way that is comforting to us and I and I appreciate that it's no longer being made comfortable for us and I don't think it should be made comfortable and if we are uncomfortable then maybe we should do something about why we're so uncomfortable with our history. For anyone interested in seeing the exhibition, it's free and runs until October 24th. And at Francis APTN National News, Toronto. A quick update now on the Kaluit water issue we told you about at the top of the show. The city says due to the possibility of petroleum hydrocarbons at the water treatment plant, a do not consume advisory is now in place. And that includes tap water for drinking and cooking. Pregnant women, newborns and infants should not take baths or be bathed in tap water. The city says do not use the water to mix infant formula. Tap water can be used for laundry, cleaning and showers. Time now for uh, another quick break, but stick around. There's more to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. The northern lights were out in full force last night and visible a lot further south than usual. Vernon Flett captured this beauty of a shot of the aurora borealis from Barrens River, Manitoba. Thank you to everyone who takes the time to submit their photos. If you want your photo featured, email them to share at aptn.ca along with the location and description. Time now for... Uh, Starting on the East Coast, 20 in Halifax, 9 with rain in St. John's. 15 with showers in Kujuwak, cloudy and 12 for Nain. 23 with rain in Montreal, 21 with showers in Shibugumu. 20 with showers in Sault Ste. Marie, cloudy and 20 in North Bay. 17 with rain for Thunder Bay, 12 and rain in Sioux Lookout. Cloudy and 9 for God's Lake, showers and 9 in Norway House. Rain and 10 for Winnipeg, 9 with showers for Dauphin. 7 and rain in Regina, Saskatoon and North Battleford. 8 and sunny for Uranium City and Stony Rapids. In Northern Alberta, 9 in High Level, Fort Chip, Fort McMurray and Peace River. 11 and sunny in Medicine Hat, Snow and 4 for Calgary.
12 with showers in Vancouver, 11 and rain in Victoria. 6 in Prince George, 10 in Fort Nelson. 0 with snow in Old Crow, flurries in 6 in Whitehorse. 8 with rain in Yellowknife, 0 in Norman Wells. Minus 4 with snow for Saks Harbor, 0 with snow in Inuvik. Plus 1 in Baker Lake and Whale Cove. Minus 8 with snow in Resolute, 3 below and snow for Joe Haven. A Yukon woman made her film debut last week at the Vancouver International Film Festival. Sarah Connors gives us a sneak peek of the short film Kiri and the Girl, as well as the touching story behind it. She needs time to heal. It's up to us to have something put aside for her. When On Thursday, ready? short film Kiri and the Girl premiered at the Vancouver International Film Festival. It's the first film written and co-produced by Kwanlun Dunn First Nation member Kiri Green, a story loosely based on her life as a 60 Scoop survivor. The film follows a young Indigenous girl named Kiri who loses her mother and reconnects with her in the spirit world. Even though I didn't lose my mother in my life, that was a symbolic of me losing my culture and through, you know, young Kiri's exploration of powwow community and discovering her culture and her cultural artwork, she really finds herself again. Green grew up in BC, away from her Yukon First Nations roots. She says working on the film helped her feel closer to her Indigenous culture. Um, you know, with the 60s scoop, that connection was broken and you really have to fight for it to, to regain it yourself. Green also makes an appearance in the film as Carrie's mother. I come to her in, in spirit form and dance with her and reconnect with her. Just, you know, I think to show, you know, that we, we still have ties to those ancestors in the spirit world and they're always looking out for us. You can watch Carrie and the Girl online through the Vancouver International Film Festival's website. Where do you go? Do you want to see? Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Musician, artist, and author T Tom Wilson is our guest on a new episode of Face to Face tonight. The three-time Juno Award winner grew up with questions about who he really was. But it wasn't until he was 56 years old that a complete stranger informed him that he was adopted. So he asked his cousin Janie if she had any answers for him. Cousin Janie's always been in my life. Cousin Janie was there my graduation. Cousin Janie was there for championship hockey games. Cousin Janie was there the first time I played Massey Hall. And I was driving Janie home and I said, Jane, you know what, I found out a couple weeks ago that mom and dad weren't really my mom and dad. And if you can tell me anything about that, please do. And she turned to me in that moment and said, Tom, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm sorry, and I hope you forgive me, but I'm your mother. And you can watch the entire episode of Face to Face in just a matter of minutes. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time for In Focus. They'll be discussing colonialism live at 3 p.m. Eastern. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.